Ja, ich habe eine und eine halbe Nase, um Interview Dr. David Pöhmerer für so eine Forschung. Dr. Pöhmerer ist ein mal kennt Neurologist, Forscher. Hans Bauer war vier Gänge in New York Times Bestseller. Han er en ikon i de amerikanske medier og verdens ekspert inden for mikrobiom. David, welcome to Copenhagen. I'm delighted to be here, Alan. Thanks for having me. And you and your wife enjoying the city so far? We think it's fantastic. And um, tonight you're going to lecture for the first time in Copenhagen, and there's over 600 people coming to see you, so there's no doubt that the microbiome is hot news just now. It's hot news for a number of reasons. I mean, I think over the years people have really understood quite well that something is happening with the bacteria in the gut that plays a role in terms of gut health. But to make the leap between the gut bacteria and the brain is really quite new and I think is running up against uh, you know, a lot of people who don't really are, are not able to embrace that connection, understanding that there is this powerful connection between our gut and therefore our lifestyle choices, the foods we eat, the medicines we take, even our sleep and exercise, which have an impact on the gut bacteria, and how that all plays out towards the fundamental process of inflammation, which is really what damages the brain. Yeah. So when we talk, for example, about Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. or Parkinson's, or multiple sclerosis, or autism, these are all fundamentally inflammatory disorders of the brain. And this is inflammation just like inflammation anywhere else in your body. If you have an arthritic knee, it's inflamed. If you have coronary artery disease, that's inflammation of the heart arteries. We now understand that even diabetes and cancer are fundamentally inflammatory. So when we take a step back and embrace the notion that Alzheimer's is inflammatory, and more importantly, that inflammation in the body is dictated by the events going on with our gut bacteria, we connect two very, very powerful dots. So, if you're looking at the main causes of Alzheimer's, it is, in many ways, starting in, in the gut with the microbiome. It's difficult to, to say it is starting there, per se, uh, but we know that, again, this mechanism of inflammation is fundamental to the brain degenerating again, across the spectrum of neurodegenerative conditions. So, for example, when we see an elevation of a laboratory marker called CRP, C-reactive protein, which very strongly correlates to Alzheimer's disease, again, it's, it's an indication uh, that there is this underlying inflammation occurring in the body. But CRP is no, in no way specific to Alzheimer's. It's a general marker mm. of inflammation. The uh, chemicals that mediate inflammation that go by technical names like TNF-alpha, for example, are strongly correlative towards Alzheimer's. Again, solidifying this connection between inflammation and then the mechanism underlying Alzheimer's. When we embrace that notion, then we ask a very important question. What is it that we are doing with our lifestyle choices that increase inflammation in the human body. Uh, and we know that, for example, having a higher blood sugar mm -hmm. is a fundamental cause of inflammation. That explains, for example, why if you become a type 2 diabetic, you have doubled your risk for developing Alzheimer's. And why that's really important is, as you and I are having this conversation today in 2017, there is no meaningful treatment on the planet that can reverse Alzheimer's disease. There's no wonder drug. Therefore, it's really important that we talk about prevention mm. as it relates to the brain. Around the world, people talk about prevention of heart disease, reducing your risk of osteoporosis by having lots of calcium and vitamin D and weight-bearing exercise. But we now know that lifestyle choices play a critical role in determining who is going to get Alzheimer's and who will not. So what are the key lifestyle choices or, or changes somebody can make to help prevent Alzheimer's? It's, a, it's an excellent question and I think it's really time that that healthcare providers really ask that question and you know rather than coming from me I think 
it's very important that healthcare providers look at what is the peer-reviewed, most well-respected scientific research from around the globe telling us. And what that research is telling us is that first, if you engage in regular aerobic exercise, you may cut your risk for Alzheimer's by as much as 50%. Yeah. That is a disease, again, for which there is no treatment. That's a very powerful mm. message, that people who exercise may have as much as a 50% risk reduction. You know, many people believe that if mom or dad had Alzheimer's, I'm going to get it and I'm, there's nothing I can do. And that's not what our scientific literature supports. Our scientific literature is very clear that exercise, uh, making sure you're getting restorative sleep, mm. keeping your blood sugar in a normal range, these are all very important factors that are associated with a reduced risk. Does it mean, Alan, that if you exercise every day and have a normal uh, blood sugar and don't have a family history of Alzheimer's that you won't get it? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it is certainly associated with reducing your risk, and that's why we're here. What about gluten? I'm asking because I'm sure you've noticed in Denmark there's bakeries on, on every corner, so it's a land that is uh, eating a, a lot of gluten. Is, is that implicated in any way in terms of Alzheimer's? No one has yet made a direct correlation, a connection between gluten and Alzheimer's connecting those dots specifically. But here's what we do know. We know that gluten induces inflammation in humans. We know that gluten contains within it another protein called alpha-gliadin. Mm. And what has recently been revealed by Dr. Fasano and his group in, uh, at Harvard, as a matter of fact, and that is that all humans develop a, some degree of gut leakiness or permeability when they are exposed to this alpha-gliadin, which is found in gluten. Gut permeability translates into inflammation in humans, and that is the cornerstone of Alzheimer's. Mm. So again, no one has said people who eat gluten-containing foods will have an increased risk of Alzheimer's. I believe it to be true. Uh, I think that we recognize, again, that gluten is related to inflammation, and if we are to believe Harvard researchers, uh, that occurs in all humans to some degree. We have to live the most anti-inflammatory lifestyle mm. that we can. We have to reduce uh, inflammation in any possible way uh, that we can. And it's not just for Alzheimer's. It has to do with cancer and diabetes and heart disease across the spectrum of degenerative conditions, which the World Health Organization now characterizes as the number one cause of death on the planet. Mm. So we've got to do everything we can to reduce inflammation. For me, the message is reduce your carbohydrates, reduce your sugar, increase your consumption of healthy fat, which certainly flies in the face of what we've been told for the so past few decades. The omega-3 oils. Olive oil, omega-3, so coconut oil. And truth. avoid the vegetable fats, the vegetable oils, the safflower oil, the corn oil, these oils that are so common in the grocery store. Those are pro-inflammatory. Mm. It's exactly what we don't want. But beyond that, we want to make sure we're getting plenty of good fiber, what we call prebiotic fiber, to nurture the gut bacteria. Mm. We've got to do everything we can to reduce the permeability or the leakiness of the gut lining. When the gut lining becomes permeable, that amplifies inflammation in the human body. Again, the cornerstone for about every disease we don't want to get, and that includes Alzheimer's. So if somebody watching the video has been diagnosed with Al Alzheimer's, could you sort of sum up what you would recommend they, they do to look after themselves in the best way they can? The first three things I would recommend would be, number one, exercise. Number two, exercise. Number three would be exercise. You knew that was coming. Uh, there are other things on the list as well. You've got to get the blood sugar down immediately. Mm. It's fundamentally important. And, you know, when your doctor gives you a pat on the back and says, well, your blood sugar is in the normal range, that's not good enough. We're not about in the normal range. We're all about what's optimal, mm. what is best. So, you know, in the normal range in America is between, let's say, 90 and 110, something like that. 
depending on who you ask. The reality is we like the blood sugar to be at 90 or below, even 85 to 90 mm -hmm. in our units. So the lower the better. And you get to a lower blood sugar by eating less sugar. Who knew? It's, it's, it's a mystery, isn't it? And in, in place of sugar, it turns out that we have to welcome fat back to the table, good healthy fat, uh, extra virgin olive oil, MCT oil, omega-3, DHA from fish oil, for mm. example. These cultivate a very healthy environment for the brain, for the heart, for the immune system. The other very important piece of the puzzle is making sure that we are nurturing, we're doing the very best we can to make our 100 trillion gut organisms happy. Because our gut bacteria, in addition to making sure that the gut lining is repaired and functional, make some very important products, some very important metabolites, we call them, that are really important for the brain. Certain things called short-chain fatty acids, for example. B vitamins are very important. There are some nutritional supplements that we like to talk about, vitamin D being perhaps on the top of the list. And here we are in Denmark, where people are probably not getting much sunshine, yeah. not making enough vitamin D. So I think supplementing with vitamin D is very appropriate. Supplementing with a prebiotic fiber to nurture the gut bacteria. Can we, can we talk a little bit more about prebiotic sure. fibers? Because it's I think most people have heard about probiotics, but prebiotics for many people might be new. And I can, in my own body, feel a, a very big difference using your uh, prebiotic uh, supplement. Prebiotics are the food for the good bacteria. They love to have that special type of fiber. People know that fiber is important, but not all fiber is necessarily prebiotic. By definition, what a prebiotic fiber does is it nurtures the gut bacteria in such a way that there is health as an outcome. Mm. Uh, and these come from various foods like chicory root, um, artichoke, mm. dandelion greens, garlic, onions, leeks. These are good sources of prebiotic fiber. You can go to a health food store and tell them you want prebiotic fiber. A lot of the prebiotic fiber that you see available in health food stores is made from what we call acacia gum. Mm. Acacia is a tree that is we see in sub-Saharan Africa, and it secretes a resin that turns out to be a very powerful way to nurture your gut bacteria. So in addition to nurturing the gut bacteria, I think it's very important to recognize that many things people do damage the gut bacteria, and that can lead to trouble. Uh, for example, antibiotics mm. are a classic example. Antibiotics kill bacteria, and yet we need our bacteria. So we want to be very, very careful and take them only when absolutely necessary in the lowest dosage that the doctor recommends. And what, what about artificial sweeteners? Uh, well, artificial was, sweeteners are very, very important because, you know, as we talk about uh, people cutting back on their sugar, there's a big tendency for people to think, well, then I will take, I will use artificial sweeteners because they're going to be good for me. Well, it looks as if that would be the worst choice you could make. Uh, a wonderful research uh, from Amsterdam, Dr. Max Newdorp, has published uh, information about how damaging these artificial sweetened beverages are, for example, in terms of the gut bacteria. Uh, we now recognize that there is a significant increased risk for both obesity and diabetes in people consuming artificial mm -hmm. sweeteners. New study that just came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association, a specialty journal called Neurology, demonstrates about a 40% increased risk of Alzheimer's in people who generally consume diet this and diet wow. that. So it's an excellent question. We know that certain medications, aside from the uh, antibiotics, are really very important. For example, uh, people seem to think they need to get rid of their stomach acid. Mm. And these drugs uh, that lower stomach acid, I don't know how popular they are here in Denmark, yeah. uh, but in America they're very popular. Everybody tends to think they don't want stomach acid, which we desperately need. So these acid-blocking drugs are also associated with a dramatic increased risk for becoming demented, mm. actually becoming an Alzheimer's patient, mm -hmm. based upon the changes to the gut bacteria. 
So if somebody is, is, is wanting to learn more about this, they can subscribe to your newsletter or um, would you recommend your Grain Brain book or your Brain Maker book for the latest information? Or uh, The latest information is on our website, which I guess could appear on the screen right now, yeah. drperlmutter.com. Whenever you log on to drperlmutter.com, uh, there's a place to sign up for the newsletter. Mm. And we send that out very frequently with updates about recommendations, about new science, about new literature. Uh, I do a lot of uh, video interviews with leaders from around the world that appear on the website every single week. Uh, Facebook, we do a lot of live Facebook interviews with people. That's David Perlmutter, MD. I'm sure you can put a graphic together for that. Sure. So I encourage people to get as much information as you can. And that's my mission, is yeah. to get out information. And when I make a statement about a certain scientific findings, we give people the exact peer-reviewed scientific reference that they can read the study mm. and then present that to their doctor and say, gee, maybe your recommendation for me to be drinking diet whatever is mm. not necessarily a good idea. Yeah. And of course the viewers can read the latest science in, in Mariana's excellent magazine, Sun Fostening, which means uh, healthy science. Healthy science, I like healthy that. Science. David, thank you very much My for pleasure. coming Thanks to for uh, Copenhagen. Me. You did a great job putting this together. Thank well, you so much, Alan. I appreciate that. And uh, I really enjoyed the time with yourself and your wife. Great. Thank you.